Through today are the two major exhibits that are going to open here in a few weeks. Uh, they are the Memphis Bell exhibit and then the Strategic Bombardment exhibit. Before I go into great detail, I, I overheard David saying something about you won't have time to go through the exhibit. He's completely right. So for the purposes of your tours, right out of the gate, I would suggest that you plan on talking about the bell in front of the aircraft for a few minutes and then going to the end of the strategic bombardment exhibit. There will be an epilogue section that will have some really compelling and sobering photographs large in large format and talk about the strategic bombing campaign and then continue. So, uh, but with that, this is the basic layout of the exhibit. The green portion is where the Memphis Bell exhibit is and the blue portion is the strategic bombardment exhibit. The, both of those exhibits combined are more than 400 linear feet and the idea here is that the Memphis Bell is the symbol of the heavy bomber crews and the strategic bombing campaign in Europe in World War II. So just as the bell is really the centerpiece and that great symbol of that campaign in history, that's the way that the bell will be presented both physically and thematically in our museum here. Question, sir. That's right, that's right. So the darker green and the darker blue indicate wall sections. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. But, but if you do have questions, please do feel free. I'd, I'd rather that you ask um, than walk away here, from here today and not have an answer. So that's the basic layout. And then also, um, as you, uh, I didn't uh, indicate it here, but as you come up to the Memphis Bell, there will be nothing in front of the airplane. It will be completely wide open, no exhibitry, uh, so you have a really nice view of the airplane just like you do with the B-29 boxcar. And then also you'll have an absolutely fantastic view of the nose art just as you come around the P-40. Just in some ways like the B-29 is, you have that long view up the aisleway. So the view is about 230 feet away and the bell will be very well lit. There's a, a, a custom, uh, light bar with 19 LED fixtures, so it will be very well lit. So this is the Memphis Bell exhibit, and visitors will not see this wall until they get up to the bow fighter or just before the bow fighter. So as they're looking up the aisleway, they'll only see the aircraft, uh, the front part of the aircraft and the nose of the aircraft. As they come around the bow fighter, they'll see this long 30-foot wall, and that will be the introduction section for the bell. It's basically a large mural of the crew members standing in front of the airplane. There's a famous photo where they're standing in a line to the left of the airplane's nose. And then there's a, a kind of a montage of newspaper articles, which is awesome. They're real newspaper articles with headlines from across the country. War heroes coming to Spokane today. A famed Memphis Bell crew coming to uh, Patterson Field, things like that. So they're scans of real newspaper articles. And then continuing around this wall here will be some basic information about the bell. It finished 25 missions on this date, it went on a war bond tour, and things like that. So the idea is that the visitors will get this great view of the Memphis Bell coming up the aisleway. As they come around, they'll see this long introductory wall, about 30 feet, and then they'll come up to the introductory wall. And then as they turn, they'll see exhibitry right here. And at the beginning of this is a video, it's about four minutes long, using color outtake footage from the Weiler movie. And uh, a lot of this footage has never been seen publicly before, which is fantastic. And again, all in color. And that video is the overall story of the bell in four minutes. So if one does not have time to go through all the exhibit and read about why the Memphis Bell is important and what it did and so on and so forth, the entire exhibit and storyline is summarized in this video. For those visitors that will be going through the, video, uh, through the exhibit, this will give them a good overview of what they'll, they'll be seeing. So continuing past that video is a panel on the nose art. So this is uh, where the nose art came from. And also there'll be a, an Esquire magazine from April 1941 on display, which is uh, where the George Petty nose art was published. Also, that fold-out will be on display and some patches that were painted by Tony Starser, who is a famous 91st Bomb Group nose artist. And the story is that he didn't paint the original nose art, but it was touched up. But there's some new information as of about three weeks ago that they may have identified the original person who painted that nose art 
in, at uh, Dow Field in the US, and if we can confirm that and look at and find photos, we may find out that Tony Starser had nothing to do with the nose art. So if that's the case, then we'll change that panel accordingly. The next panel is about Margaret Polk. She is the Memphis Belle. She was the girlfriend of the pilot. He met her in Walla Walla, Washington when he was in training. She was there with her sister who was dating a, another crewman in that unit, 91st Bomb Group. They had a, a romance. He actually went to Memphis before he deployed. So the, the name Memphis Bell, he got the idea from a movie called Lady for a Night that he went out and saw. There was a, a paddle boat called the Memphis Bell. And so he named the airplane in honor of her. And so this is a little bit about her story. He also carried a picture of her in the cockpit on combat missions. And there's a great big photo of him in the cockpit with that photo of her that he carried. And then the next panel is about combat aircraft to museum artifact. And that tells the story of the Memphis Bell, what happened to the Memphis Bell from the end of the war bond tour to today. And so it, it goes over, it uses a training aircraft in Florida, went to a boneyard in Oklahoma, went to Memphis in 1946, was in Memphis till 2005. Also talks about how it sat outside for many years. Then the MBMA, uh, Memphis Bell Memorial Association did restoration work, put it on Mud Island. And then finally the airplane came here to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. The next section is called Bomber Firsts. It highlights three aircraft that had other heavy bomber firsts. The important thing to know here is that every single airplane that anyone says was the first has to be qualified. No one can say this airplane was the first Army Air Force's heavy bomber to finish 25 missions, period. No one can say that, and this is why. There's the first airplane Army Air Force's heavy bomber to finish 25 missions was a B-17 in the Pacific. We don't know which one. It was a crazy time in 1942. We were on the defensive. We were getting our behinds kicked. So we don't have the records to prove which one was the first, but we do know there was an airplane called Suzy Q, which was a B-17E. We, knew it, we know that it flew far more than 25 missions, and we know that it came back to the U.S., I believe it's in October, it's in the fall of 1942, about the time that the Memphis Bell deployed, that Suzy Q went on a war bond tour around the country. So we know that the first Army Air Force's heavy bomber was one in the Pacific. It was not one in Europe. So what we say about the Suzy Q is the first Army Air Force's heavy bomber to finish 25 missions and come home. The other two aircraft that are highlighted are Hell's Angels, which many people believe to be the first heavy bomber to finish 25 missions. Uh, it's not, it's the first heavy bomber to finish 25 missions over Europe. There were a few other B-17s that finished 25 missions over Europe before the Bell. We're not gonna list every one in the exhibit. Um, the way the text says is uh, there were other heavy bombers that finished 25 missions before the Bell, including. And then the last one that we highlight is Hot Stuff, which was a B-24 that was the first heavy bomber to finish 25 missions uh, first 8th Air Force heavy bomber to finish 25 missions. Important thing about the hot stuff is that it did not fly 25 missions over Europe. It deployed to the Mediterranean, flew about half of its missions in the Mediterranean, including bombing North African ports and doing patrols over the Mediterranean. But it was the fir first 8th Air Force heavy bomber to finish 25 missions. It unfortunately was destroyed when it hit the side of a mountain in Iceland on the way back to the U.S killing everyone on board except for the tail gunner, also killed General Andrews, who's a very important figure in Air Force history, and there'll be a piece of the wreckage uh, from hot stuff on display in the exhibit. But the point being here, Memphis Bell was not the first, but all these other firsts also have to be qualified. So visitors will go through this area, read about these things, and then as they come around, the heavy, or excuse me, the strategic bombing exhibit starts here. I'll cover that in a minute. I will stay on the subject of the Memphis Bell for our purposes here. As a visitor comes around the corner, there's an incredible space that's being created, a very intimate space that includes artifacts from the Memphis Bell crew, video of each of the crew members, literally in the shadow of the airplane. It, it, it it's, uh, gives me goosebumps to see it because there will be artifacts from seven of the Memphis Bell crew on display, a four by eight panel of each of the crew members and a really nice portrait photo of each one with a quote directly from each one telling some important part of the story. So that basically is this alcove right here and it's capped off with these curved walls. 
And this area in here has kind of the basic overall story of the Memphis Bell crew. And uh, in a nutshell, it's very complicated, but the way to explain the Memphis Bell and the crew being intact and flying all their missions on the Memphis Bell, that's a myth that didn't happen. The way that I characterize it accurately and without going into the weeds is to say the Memphis Bell crew flew most of their missions together and most of them on the Memphis Bell. Um, if you want to be a little more specific, eight of the crew members flew nearly all their missions together and 20 of their missions on the Memphis Bell and five on other aircraft. But that's in a nutshell, kind of just basically says the crew wasn't intact, they didn't fly all their missions on the Bell. Then there's a video right here, which again is using footage from the outtakes that uh, much of which has not seen before. And each crew member gets about 10 seconds or so. The video is about three minutes long and basically shows each crew member in some uh, candid, uh, casual way. You can kind of see their personalities. It's in color, which is great because it brings them to life. And then here are the individual crew panels. And what's just wonderful is that these cases and these panels here are literally in the shadow of the airplane that they flew on. It's, it's a, an amazing space. And there are artifacts from seven of the Memphis Bell crew members. They all came from the families. Uh, the only artifacts that we had from the Memphis Bell crew originally were from Morgan. And we had those when we started this process. And then we tracked down family members and they were very, very generous. So there'll be seven cases in this area here. And there's a panel here about Colonel Stanley Ray and kind of the 91st Bomb Group, which was their unit. Stanley Ray was uh, really quite incre incredible. He ended up becoming a major general when, uh, and ultimately, of course, retiring. He had to deal with uh, a really difficult situation. He was sending young men to die, and they were doing it on a pretty regular basis. And Ray was, uh, he had a personality where he had a lot of humor. And he, I've never, I never got the chance to meet him, unfortunately. He passed long before I started here, but he, he's always smiling, or almost always smiling. So one of the real gems that are in the section on Ray is his Order of the Rigid Digit, which was this humor medal with a hand with a middle finger on it. And there's a story, he was awarded the first one. But also, too, Ray flew two combat missions with the Memphis Bell crew. One of those was with the Memphis Bell crew on the Bell, and another one was with the Memphis Bell crew when they were flying a substitute airplane. So he was with the crew and uh, he was uh, leading the group in combat. So he is kind of part of the Memphis Bell crew, so that's why we've included him here. There's a little panel on the end that just talks about, basically in a nutshell, the crew's 25th mission was not the Bell's 25th mission. The Bell finished its 25th mission on May 17th. Uh, the airplane, that was the airplane's 24th mission. So an unbeknownst to uh, any kind of reasoning, they sent the airplane two days later to Kiel. Now the first airplane picked got shot down, so I don't know what they were thinking, sending the, because if the Bell got shot down, they don't have an airplane to send back to the States. But nevertheless, it survived. It was damaged on that mission by a waste gunner who inadvertently put some 50 caliber rounds in the tail, I guess as he was tracking a German fighter. But that, that uh, panel just basically says, crew finished on 17th of May, airplane finished on the 19th of May, two days later. Around the corner is a panel on the war bond tour. There are a couple of photos from when the Bell came here to Patterson Field, and um, including a photo at NCR where the pilot and the co-pilot are pictured with Orville Wright and Colonel Deeds. So there's also, we have a little local connection in that. And then the Memphis Bell section ends with a panel and a case about William Wyler. Uh, question. Correct. They did not. It was an uh, entirely different crew, and, and none of them with any connection to the Memphis Bell. I, there may, I think, I take that back. The waste gunner Scott Miller, Scott Miller may have been on that mission. Um, I've got a spreadsheet with literally 700 cells in it that's this long and this high with every detail. I, I think Miller might have been on that mission, but the Memphis Bell crew was not on that mission. Thank you. So you're welcome. Yes, sir. Yeah, Two thousand five, uh, Bob Hansen, and um, Bob Morgan had passed away shortly before him, unfortunately. 
But thankfully, there are literally hundreds of family members that are coming to the opening, and we're just, we're just delighted that the families will be here. I think that's, that's as close as we can get to those, to those guys. So that ends the Memphis Bell exhibit, and then uh, we can go on to the strategic bombing exhibit. Did anyone have any questions about the Bell exhibit at this time? Okay, yes? So the airplane itself is gonna be on a pedestal? It will be, it will be on a mount in flying attitude, and we're doing it in such a way that has, we've never done before. We're gonna keep a little bit of surprise for everybody, but it's very dramatic, and it allows us to put a large exhibit around the airplane, which we need to do, the World War II gallery is by far the tightest gallery in this museum. So we're removing one airplane, ultimately, the P-63, and there's very good reasons for it. The, the P-63, this, um, for those of you that might not be aware, it's the orange airplane. And it's an interesting story about training gunners with uh, using f frangible bullets and actually shooting at these airplanes. But here's the problem. The RP-63 is a poor representation of a pinball airplane and that's what that program was called. The pinball airplanes had armor on them, it was a different version of the P-63, and it had these lights that when it got hit with these frangible bullets, the lights would go off. Well, our P-63 doesn't have any of that. The, another connection to the Army Air Forces that might be of use would be Lend-Lease. We gave a whole lot of P-63s to the Soviet Union. Well, our version is not one of those. It's not a P-63A. And our version, they only made 12 of them. The wing is different. So it's really, it's painted to look like a pinball airplane, but it's not configured in any way like them. And it's a really poor representation. Plus, we have an excellent illustration of mid-engine inline technology and cannons firing through the prop hub with the P-39 that's right next to it. So of course, to put the bell in and give it the space that it deserves as a national treasure, that has to come at some kind of cost. So um, I think removing one airplane, I'm very satisfied that we only had to remove this one. You might notice that the storch is gone. That's not to get it off exhibit so much as this, the fabric was splitting and it needs to, be, uh, needs to be restored. So that's why that was taken off exhibit. So, do you have a question, sir? Yes, uh, are there plans to update the cockpit 360 aft and the That's the intent. So the uh, interior restoration will continue while it's on display. None of these sections as they stand now are complete, except for that Bombay is either complete or nearly complete. But the, on, the ongoing work, I can't say how long it's gonna take. It's not gonna be a decade, you know. It's, it, uh, but we know how it's configured, but it's gonna take time to finish that restoration. The intent is when it's done, we do a full 360 from nose to tail, and then have that on display in front of the airplane along with putting it on the website. And I can't wait to see it. I think that will be awesome. The inside of the bell has been a real challenge to try and figure out how it's configured because of these modifications that were done in theater on the fly, but because of the outtakes we have, we know what it looks like on the inside. It's a matter of fabricating the pieces and installing them. So, okay, so I'll move on to the strategic bombing exhibit. So there's, uh, this is the start of the strategic bombing exhibit. I neglected to mention both the Memphis Bell intro and the strategic bombing intro have some really awesome exhibitry. It's, the surfaces are three-dimensional and clad in olive drab metal that has simulated rivets on it. So it looks kind of like air for aircraft structure. It's really cool. And the letters are blown plastic that are backlit. So it, it will be compelling and, and draw visitors in. So the first element in past the strategic bomb intro is the animated map. I'll show you a still from that as we get through this section, but I can't reverse this using this thing, so I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, past that is a section on leaders and talks about Acre, Spots, and Doolittle having very important roles in the strategic bombing campaign in Europe, along with some artifacts from them, and I'm really delighted by that because they, all three of those individuals were tremendous leaders in the, in the Army Air Forces, case of Spots, he was our first chief of staff. So we don't always have that much in the way of exhibitry about some of these great leaders. So it's wonderful to have that in the context of their role in leading the strategic bombing campaign. Do you have a question? A couple of questions about the classic movie, 12 O'Clock High. Was the author, Bernie Lay, was he there at the same time that 
the Memphis Bell in the beginning of the strategic bombing campaign? I, I honestly don't know, but I would guess that he was, or shortly after, because that was a time when they were under tremendous pressure to produce results, and Aker was just trying to keep, he was trying to produce results, but not at the destruction of the force. So he was trying to protect it. You know, if they took unsustainable losses, they would, all, they would completely fail. So I, I would guess that he probably was, plus he'd been around for a long time in the Army Air Forces and Air Corps. You know, he wasn't a lieutenant, as you well know. Um, I just don't know for sure. Yeah, I just wonder if any of the uh, characters in the movie were close enough to be identified with actual. They are, yeah, they are. And there's, it's been written about that. They are, some of those characters are real people. So, and that caused some, some uh, sore feelings, I think, for some people, but um, question. In the group that you worked with, was there any uh, lasting heartache with the decision not to put a P-51 Mustang near the Memphis Bell? There'll be a P-51 right next to the, to the Bell when all the airplanes move in. Yeah. But, but P-51s never escorted the Bell, of course. They came long after. As a matter of fact, just if you, anybody ever asks as a characterization, the P-47s didn't come in until the last month and a half of the Bell's combat tour. It was British Spitfires they were being escorted by. Sometimes RAF pilots, sometimes Army Air Forces pilots, which I think is a little bit of a surprise because we think, oh, it must have been P-47s, right? But they weren't. Um, it was almost always Spitfires. Just right at the end, there were P-47s coming so in. So the Spitfires didn't have that long range. Uh, so the, that's right. This one did not go deep into Germany then. Uh, it, there were missions that went to Wilhelmshaven, went to Kiel, I went to Bremen, so there were, they just didn't have escort. Yeah, yeah, and they paid for it too. So, um, so it's great that we have a section on leaders. Then there's a section on early operations here, and I'd like to make the point that we made a conscious decision. This is not an 8th Air Force exhibit about strategic bombardment. It's not, it's not the 8th Air Force. It's Army Air Force's strategic bombardment in Europe, which includes 9th and 12th Air Force heavy bombers early in the campaign. That's not well known or understood. It also includes the 15th Air Force and, of course, the 8th Air Force. So the whole exhibit is seamless, talking about the strategic bombing campaign, not just the 8th. And we made a conscious decision because we could have put the 15th Air Force in the Mediterranean Theater of Operations in a different area around the B-24 or something like that. But, um, and I think it's the right decision that we have it as a seamless exhibit about strategic bombardment. So this early operations section is split into Mediterranean-based, which is 9th and 12th Air Force at the time, and 8th Air Force. So basically, in a nutshell, 9th and 12th heavy bombers are mostly doing essentially almost tactical air support, hitting German ports, you know, trying to prevent supplies getting to the Africa Corps. And the 8th Air Force was primarily attacking U-boat pens in France to try and somehow stem the tide of the U-boat scourge in, in the Atlantic, which actually was not successful. And then there's a little section on combat formations, and there's some diagrams from manuals that show that basically they flew in these big formations for interlocking fields of fire and so on. Then just past this is a section called Life at 25K. We do have some enhancements that will be added after the exhibit opens, so I'm not 100% sure whether there will be a case there. I think there probably will at opening. If not, it'll be shortly after. But this section is just basically about it wasn't just the Germans that our bomber crewmen had to worry about. They had to worry about the, the hostility of flying at 25,000 feet in unpressurized airplanes. And basically that being there isn't enough oxygen to survive, as we well know, and the fact that the, the bitter cold temperatures at 25,000 feet, it got as cold as 50 degrees below zero. And in fact, the Memphis Bell's second ball turret, or I'm sorry, second top turret gunner took off his gloves for two minutes on a mission and it put him in the hospital for a month, and he almost lost his hands. So it just basically talks about they wore this clothing, they had electrically heated flight suits, they had all different kinds of oxygen systems in the airplane, walk-around bottles and so on, and something to think about, there's a diagram, oxygen is explosive. And these airplanes had all, several oxygen tanks that are this big, and there's a diagram that shows where all these oxygen tanks are, and you think if those get pierced and they explode, and they're getting shot at by anti-aircraft guns and German fighters. So the danger wasn't just um, the German defenses. It was also just flying at that altitude that we do all the time in airliners without any thought today. And then it kind of shifts gears 
into the CBO, which is the Combined Bomber Offensive. So the, uh, this is the animated bombing map, and we're, we're pretty excited about this. This was all done entirely in-house. And what this animated bombing map does that will be at the beginning of the strategic bombing exhibit is in about three minutes in real time, it shows the strikes, both with English, England-based and Mediterranean-based heavy bomber strikes in Europe. Uh, we did not include any of the strikes in North Africa. So what you see is early on, it's very, very slow. It, you know, there isn't a lot going on. It's kind of quiet. It starts to pick up, and then by mid-44, it's just a staccato. I mean, it just... It's just uh, strike after strike after strike. And uh, it also tracks the advance of ground forces. So you really see by 45, Germany was squeezed and being completely pulverized. You see it visually. Also, as it goes through, it tracks the tonnage dropped and the number of bombers lost in real time. So the spreadsheet for the strikes alone is 33 pages long. And we got this uh, really, really great uh, young guy in exhibits who was able to take all this information and put it into essentially a digital animation. It also has some pop-ups of some significant moments. But the, the point of this is basically just for the visitor to watch this and understand that the campaign started out slow. It picked up until it was, uh, was enormous and ferocious that we didn't just bomb Germany because, of course, we bombed from Norway down to Greece over to France. Um, but those are kind of the main points of this animated map. Then for the enthusiast, there's a lot more information. We don't expect the average person to kind of pick this up or see it, but they'll, they might focus on the tonnage being dropped or some of these pop-ups. So that will be right at the start of the strategic bombing campaign. And, uh, and that's another one of those things that if someone doesn't read anything else, if they just watch this, they'll get a sense of, of what that campaign was. Also, too, right past this, I neglected to mention, and it shows up in this. Uh, many people understand the first heavy bomber strike by the Army Air Forces as the strike that was on August 17, 1942, flying from England. That actually was not the first heavy bomber strike by our forces in Europe. In June, three months before, two or three months before, there was a strike by about 10 B-24s on Ploesti in Romania. They were flying from the Mediterranean, and it's really not well known, so there's a panel about that. that so this first strike was in June. Nothing happens again until August out of England. So continuing on, did anyone, anyone have any questions at this point? Okay, so uh, continuing on, we have the combined bomber operations, and, and essentially combined bomber operations take us all the way to the end of the war. And all that really means is the British were flying at night and bombing at night, and we were flying during the day. So the Germany and its plants across Europe were being hit 24 hours a day, essentially. Now, there's some, some might think that this was a fully integrated campaign between the two and that it was seamless. It was not. The, the British bomber leader kind of wanted to do his own thing, so it was, it was loosely coordinated. Um, that's just, and that basically says that in exhibit text. So the characterization of when they decided to do these co combined bomber operations, this is when we begin to see larger formations. When the bell was flying, this is this early part, and there's 150 airplanes or 100 airplanes. This is not 1,500 bomber formations that we think of when we think of the strategic bombing campaign. But this is where we begin to get larger formations, 300, 400 bombers. This is all, also when we begin to take some catastrophic losses unsustainable losses. So it goes through the bigger raids. There's a little vignette on communication. You know, how, how do you communicate? Our biggest raid was about 2,000 bombers in the air. That's 20,000 airmen. How do they communicate without, without garbling each other? How do they communicate in real time? So that little vignette is things like flare guns, using, um, using lights with colored filters, using Morse code, you know, using a telegraph key, it's just different ways that they, could, they communicated. And then there's a great section called Deadly Skies, a very, very nice design. This is basically about the Luftwaffe, their fighters and their anti-aircraft guns, and there's a nice case that, that will be in there. Uh, on the end here, there's a little end cap, and we took advantage of that space to have a panel about the Memphis Bell publicity markings. So there's some great shots, and those publicity markings are basically markings that were added by public affairs or by the public themselves when they were drawing on the Memphis Bell. 
All of those markings are not in the bell because we've chosen to mark the aircraft, the artifact, as it was shortly after the 25th mission. So just some really nice shots, all of those in color. And also too, we've got a nice photo of close up of one of the carved names that were in the fuselage of the bell. So we took, uh, it's a picture that we took during the restoration before it was painted. So then there's a corner in here, and this is a very important corner and really a sobering corner. We had three catastrophic raids in the summer and fall of 1943. There was uh, Ploesti, a combined raid against um, uh, Schweinfurt and Plo uh, Regensburg, and then there was another raid against Schweinfurt in um, October. And between those three raids, we lost 174 heavy bombers. And that was unsustainable. We actually had another raid in that time where we lost 45 bombers. So this kind of highlights each raid and what happened. And to communicate the ferocity of these raids, for instance, the Ploesti raid, there were five medals of honor awarded for that one raid to Army Air Force's airmen. And that mentions that. And um, one of those medals of honor is actually on display, which is wonderful. So we have these bigger raids, and then we have these catastrophic raids, and essentially we were defeated. Uh, it, it, it was made apparent that heavy bombers cannot protect themselves on deep strikes without fighter escort. That was a premise that the whole strategic bombing campaign was based on. So we were defeated at this point. Just past it is uh, the stained glass. We didn't want to move that because it's fairly fragile, so we figured out a way to, to weave it into the storyline. So this... Uh, stained glass comes right after these catastrophic raids. So it's a, it's a solemn and sobering moment. So to have stained glass there is appropriate for some reflection. And then right past it is a section on the 15th Air Force. And that, that um, stained glass is, is kind of about Lady Be Good, which flew out of the Mediterranean. So we, we've woven it into the storyline without having to move it. So it will be unchanged as it was before. It'll be backlit like it was. So the 15th Air Force, that is when the Army Air Force has said, okay, we're going to take all our heavy bombers in the Mediterranean, the 9th and 12th Air Force, and we're going to put them into one Air Force, and we're going to base them in southern Italy. And that was the 15th Air Force. That was November of 1943. Question? Are you retaining any of the uh, artifacts from the We are, but not there. So what will be kind of a, a second phase, if you will, after the bell opens, is to reconstruct the Mediterranean theater of operations around the B-24. So we had the 12th Air Force exhibit that was up there for some time off the right wing of the B-24. That will either be placed there as it was, or the, there'll be new panels printed. And then we will have storyline about Lady Be Good. Carpet baggers will be there too, even though that's Europe. They use B-24, so we'll put that there. And then there will be uh, new exhibitry that tells some of the same stories on those red and black panels like Pantelleria, Invasion of Sicily, Invasion of Italy, things like that. So that will be, that will be on display. The, lady, the story of the Lady Be Good will be on display, but it's going to be down the road um, in the near term, not, you know, not a decade from now. But, so that will happen after the bell rolls out. So past the 15th Air Force, we have a couple of vignettes about, one is about mechanics and bomb loaders, and you know, it, <laughs> it's there. Um, and I curated this exhibit, so um, if something's not in there, you can, you can holler at me and I'll be happy to, happy to talk about it. Obviously, without mechanics and bomb loaders, the airplanes don't fly. And also, too, in the crew exhibit, or the crew video, the crew video ends with the statement, I'm paraphrasing, but the, with the statement that, um, and there was another crew that was essential to the Memphis Bell's success, the ground crew. And there's color footage of the ground crew, and it says words to the effect of, without the hard work and competence of the ground crew, the Memphis Bell flight crew would not have finished their tour. And that's how that ends. And then there's uh, also a picture of Joe Jambrone the crew chief of the Memphis Bell and his family would be coming to the opening, along with another Memphis Bell ground crewman by the his he was name was his name was Leonard Bus Sowers from Alabama. So not forgotten. There's a very compelling artifact that's in the that part of the exhibit. There was a bomb that was inadvertently set off that set off twelve hundred tons of bombs. That wasn't the only time that that happened, but, but in this case, I can't remember the, the base, 
But anyways, the, the seven guys who were working that disappeared. They were, they, they disappeared. However, this piece of twisted bomb casing was found in the 70s and dug up. And in the folds of this twisted steel is the rubber sole of a shoe, which was from one of the bomb loaders. That was all that was left of them. So there are some very sobering artifacts in the exhibit that will cause people to pause and really understand some of the violence that, that these young men faced. So just past the mechanics and bomb loaders is a section on wax. Uh, the Women's Army Corps was very important to not only the 8th Air Force, but the 9th Air Force in England. And the Army Air Forces had the overwhelming share of the Women's Army Corps personnel. Uh, most of the work that they did was uh, telegraph operators, clerical, and things like that. Uh, but I'd make the point, and I would make this point to visitors, this is long of, before the day, of course, of computers keeping track of things for us. So making sure that the paperwork was properly sent, properly filed, dealing with te uh, telephone communications uh, was integral to the success of the 8th Air Force. And then there were about 10% of the WACs who had uh, non-traditional roles, which included being MPs. Another very important non-traditional role that the WACs did was to be in these mobile flight control vans. And what they would do is not only help with flight operations at the bases, but when aircraft were lost and they had no idea where they were at, they would use radio navigation to help them figure out where they were at and help get them back to base. That saved lives. And then they also plotted aircraft that were in the air in real time. Again, we don't have the sophisticated computer systems we have now. They were plotters on these big tables and they'd move airplanes around. So there were about 8,000 WACs that served in the UK during World War II and what's even more awesome is we have a uniform from a WAC who served not only in the 8th but the 9th Air Force. When the war ended, she became uh, a pitcher in a league of their own. She, she played in the Women's Professional Baseball League, and then when that went belly up, she went back to the Air Force and re-enlisted in what was now the Air Force, and she retired as a Chief Master Sergeant in the 1970s. It's just an awesome story, and we have this wonderful uniform from her that will be on display there. And then right around the corner, we have a couple panels on fighter escort. That was the war winner, as many of you know. That was the war winning combination. Fighters that had the capability to escort our heavy bombers all the way to the target and back. It's a combination of two factors. Actually, I take that back, three factors. It was the introduction of useful drop tanks, which came a little bit later than they probably should have. Improvements to existing fighters like the P-47 and the P-38 and then the introduction of the P-51. So those combination of factors allowed our fighters to escort the bombers all the way to the target and back. There's an apocryphal story, and I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know that anyone will ever know it's true, but an apocryphal story that when um, uh, Goering, the head of the German Air Force, saw P-51s over Berlin, he said the war is lost. I think it's probably apocryphal, but it's, it's telling um, because they really couldn't defend themselves once we had fighters that could escort uh, our bombers all the way to the target and back, with the exception of their 88s. Those remain deadly. Just past that is Big Week. The idea of Big Week here is that they're going to break the back of the German fighter force by bombing their factories and forcing them to come up and defend them. The reason why they want to break the back of the German fighter force is primarily so that uh, we had total air superiority to allow the invasion of France. And here we have one of the most important parts of the contribution of the strategic bombing campaign in World War II. There are those that argue that it was a failure, and they're wrong. And I don't say that because I'm a curator here at the Air Force's National Museum. They're, they're just simply incorrect. So Big Week targeted these aircraft factories, and they did a lot of damage. But the fact of the matter is German fighter production continued to rise into 1944. That is a fact. Now, they had slack in their production. They weren't working three shifts a day, every day a week. So they found ways to increase their production in spite of our bomber attacks. However, we were killing their fighter pilots. And it doesn't matter how many airplanes an Air Force has. If they don't have experienced fighter pilots to fly them, it's irrelevant. And Big Week killed uh, probably about 20% of their experienced fighter pilots. So this is in February of 44. So by the time we get to D-Day, 
and, and the landing craft are hitting the beach, the German Air Force isn't anywhere to be found. I think that they flew something like 30 sorties that first day or something. It was ridiculous. We could not have invaded Europe successfully if the German fighter force was still intact. So the heavy bomber campaign forced them to defend their air, uh, to defend their skies, and then we killed their fighter pilots in combat. So next past that is Berlin. We started flying our first strikes against Berlin early in 1944. Berlin remained a very important target right to the end of the war. Berlin is huge, and its suburbs are huge, and there, are, there were numerous factories in the Berlin area. Just past that is a panel on bomb blind bombing. This is very important, and we need to be honest. A lot is made of the daylight bombing campaign being more precise than the British area bombing at night. It was when there were visual bombing conditions. As those of you that have spent time in Europe know, there's overcast. It's like being in Dayton. You know, from the fall into the spring, there's overcast very frequently. It is, absolutely. So guess what system they were using to bomb when it was cloudy like that? Yeah, essentially the same system that the British were using. So there was area bombing done in essence. I mean, it was as precise as was possible. So that just basically says, we called it Mickey. Yeah, we called it Mickey, so we did, but when we were bombing visually, the Norden, especially in the last couple years of the war, was pretty accurate. We had uh, learned an awful lot, of, and also they were using lead bombardiers, to uh, the best bombardiers to drop for the whole group. So instead of each plane having their bombardier aim, they would take the most experienced and skilled bombardiers, and they would drop on the signal of the lead bombardier. So just past blind bombing is Operation Frantic. Um, Operation Frantic wasn't a, a huge program, but basically the idea was they would fly from Italian or British bases, bomb a target in Eastern Europe and land in Russia, fly a few missions from those bases in Russia, and then come back to their bases uh, in due course. Uh, it did not have an, a significant effect on the campaign. There were only seven of those frantic missions, but nevertheless, it's still an interesting part, and we had some nice artifacts that are related to that. So then we get to D-Day, and as I'd mentioned, by that point, the heavy bomber campaign had broke the back of the German Luftwaffe. The role of the uh, heavy bomber forces, 8th Air Force, with D-Day was to prep the areas behind what would become enemy lines by destroying bridges, hitting concentrations, hitting rail yards, essentially helping cut off the ability of the Germans to send reinforcements to Normandy. Uh, the tactical air forces were doing the same thing at the time. The strategic bombing cam lead campaign leaders were a little frustrated because it took the pressure off of some of the targets deep in Europe, but it was the right thing to do. Also, the heavy bombers were part of the deception campaign to try and trick the Germans into thinking that we we're going to land at the Pas de Calais, which is much closer. It makes no sense to land in Normandy. Pas de Calais is right across the channel, and Normandy is significantly further. So we had a deception campaign, and so they were hitting targets in Pas de Calais to make the Germans think. And in, as a matter of fact, it was brilliantly successful because for the first 24 hours, the Germans thought that our landing at, the, at Normandy was the deception, and then we were going to land at Pas de Calais. So, and then after we landed, um, we were stuck somewhat in the area of Normandy, and there was a huge breakout called Cobra, and the heavy bombers were a part of that. They absolutely <laughs> dropped an enormous amount of tonnage on German troop concentrations to help with that breakout out of Normandy. So uh, many of you are aware of arc light in Vietnam and the use of B-29s for tactical purposes in Korea, um, but that was not the first time that that was done with heavy bombers. I mean, it was done in World War II um, with D-Day. So then this is where the strategic bombing campaign exhibit finishes. There's the 88, it's painted as an 88 that one would find, a typical 88 one would find in Europe shooting at our heavy bombers. As many of you know, it had painted, been painted as an Africa or Mediterranean 88, uh, kind of a tan color. This is now painted gray with kill rings on it, which many of them had. You know, if they shot down a bomber, they would paint a white ring on it. Um, and then there's a section called Strategic Bombing Victorious, and this is where we have these raids of 1,500 aircraft and pretty much um, unstoppable raids. And there are uh, several photos of uh, some of the targets that they were hitting. This is the other part 
of the contribution of the heavy bomber campaign to victory. They broke the back of the German Air Force by early 1944, by the spring of 44, and then towards the end of the war in late 44, they really, really focused on oil production and transportation infrastructure, and they leveled it. German oil production was re reduced to less than 5% of their maximum production, so they hit oil refineries. They hit, uh, when the Russians overran Romania, Germany mostly only had synthetic oil production, which is very vulnerable. And then they also hit bridges, they hit rail yards. That was probably the most important thing was the marshalling yards. If the marshalling yards are wrecked, there's no way to move trains around. And if you read anything about any German soldiers in World War II, they talk about coming home on leave and not being able to get back. Or not being, you know, they have to walk or hitch rides because the rail yards are wrecked. And they even went after the canal system, the German canal system, which was important there. So in a nutshell, the Germans couldn't move. And, and a lot of that had to do with the heavy bomber campaign. And for instance, those of you that are familiar with the Battle of the Bulge, the whole idea was to, to get all the way to the coast. But that was not their first objective for their ground forces. Their first objective was to get to the fuel dumps, the big allied fuel dump, because they didn't have enough fuel to get to the coast. So the strategic bombing campaign towards the end of the war, in essence, paralyzed German ground forces because they had no fuel and their transportation systems were wrecked. So they made them more vulnerable to land invasion, which ultimately produced victory. And then the last section is the epilogue. The epilogue has some really great color photographs, big color photographs, from the Army Air Force's teams that were sent out to these targets. So when the war ended, they were incredibly smart with the way that they studied the, the campaign. They sent teams out to take pictures of these sites and understand what did the heavy bomber campaign actually do. And they did it because they wanted to understand it better for the historical record, but also to take this information, this knowledge, and use it in the ongoing campaign against Japan. So these teams went out and they took color photos on the ground of these various sites. And it, the devastation is it's shocking. It's not a hole in a building. It's, there's nothing left of the building but the first 10 or 12 courses of the bricks and uh, docks that are wrecked and half-sunk U-boats. And you look at it, it's one of those things, you don't even really need to read a caption. You look at it and you, you see the utter devastation. It reminds me of someone describing what happened to a town when a tornado went through it, and then you see the pictures. And so it's that same kind of, uh, that same kind of thing. There's also a picture of a B-24 that is being utterly ripped apart and on fire, a big tongue of flame. So it's sobering, and there's a picture of the rows of crosses at the Cambridge Cemetery, um, which has many uh, allied, or I'm sorry, many Army Air Forces airmen buried there. And the point of this being is to say, this is what the heavy bomber campaign accomplished. And it's very specifically points these things out that I just mentioned. But then it also mentioned the tremendous cost. We lost more than 30,000 heavy bomber crewmen in combat in the fight against Germany. And to put that in the context, there were 20,000 U.S. Marines killed in all of World War II. Think about those numbers. We know how bloody it was for the U.S. Marines, and they have earned every honor that, uh, that they did in the campaigns that they fought in the Pacific. But we lost more than 10,000 more heavy bomber crewmen. And it's not well understood, it's not well known. It came at an enormous price. So that section is an alcove with these photos, with these sobering photos, and the accounting of what happened. And there is a quote from the wall, it's a partial quote, from the wall of the missing, which has more than 5,000 names of, of, of servicemen who were never found at the Cambridge Cemetery. And I'm paraphrasing, but it says words to the effect of those who hereafter live in freedom owe a debt to remember the sacrifice of these men. And that is our mission. That is what we do here. The public doesn't even know that they owe a debt. A lot of people don't. So that's the point of if you're taking a tour through, you can talk about the bell, and then you can just you can stay in front of the bell right here, and then cut across to this epilogue. And because it's a kind of a self-contained alcove, you can say, this is what the heavy bomber campaign did, and this is what it cost us, and look at these images. And when you have time after the tour, make sure you come back and go in the exhibit and see you know, these amazing artifacts and, and this great story and, and things like that.
So I think uh, with that, that covers all of both exhibits. Did, uh, did anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, you know what? I've got the exact people here to talk about it. We planned it that way, right, guys? Uh, they, they, there's two staff members who did an amazing job okay. refurbishing the 8th Air Force. Can you, can you talk about it, guys? It's long overdue, and they did a fantastic job. All right, thanks, Brett. That's, uh, that's Brett Stoley and Christina Douglas. They're curators and research, and they did that independently, and we're so glad that they did because we want to put our best foot forward when the thousands of people come here. So thanks a lot. I appreciate that. The other um, quick thing that yeah. I had was um, any reason why we don't pick up this big event here, Shushu Baby? Well, we, we've talked about that, and sh uh, Shushu Shoe Baby is the property of the Smithsonian. So if it sits outside and a microburst comes from out of nowhere, then that could be a problem. So I, we, we discussed it, and I don't, I, I'm not sure if we asked the Smithsonian or not. I just honest, honestly can't remember, but it was discussed. But any time an airplane is outside, there's risk, and that's not our airplane anymore. It's here, but it's not our property any longer. Okay. So that's a good question. We thought it would be cool to have it parked outside the tower as a backdrop. We even and then And then we talked about having one of the fly-in B-17s do that, but then there's safety issues with an operational aircraft with fuel in it. So, so we've been countered, you know, in, in some of those cases. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Well, Question. The, uh, on the, uh, the exhibit itself, the Memphis Valley Jews portrays a story. Is the story is the strategic bombing exhibit, is mm -hmm. that correct? It's both. I would, have to, I would have to confirm those figures. I can tell you this. I've gone through more than 5,000 pages of statistical documents of the Army Air Forces at the National Archives on three trips. And they have done studies. And the, the telling study that I know from direct primary source information, because I have not seen a single uh, an accurate accounting of heavy bomber casualties in any secondary source publication anywhere. That's in part why I went to the National Archives. I can tell you this, the, they did a study, Army Air Forces did a study to try and understand the casualty rate of heavy bomber crews in the 8th Air Force. They picked four bomber groups, the 91st, 303rd, I can't remember the other two, and they compared their casualty rates to other Air, Army Air Forces theaters of operation and also to what they considered to be the heaviest ground combat, most dangerous ground combat in the U.S. Army at the time, which at the time of the study was being at the front lines in North Africa. And they compared the casualty rates of an infantryman, so this is not transport, this is not supply, artillery, these are guys in the foxholes shooting their garrons and getting shot at. And what they determined was statistically an Army Air Forces crewman in one of these four bomb groups 
was six times more likely to become a casualty than an infantryman at the front lines in North Africa. That would be POW, wounded, or killed, uh, correct. And they also determined that a heavy bomber crewman in one of those four groups was 14 times more likely to become a total loss, which would be killed, POW, missing, or wounded so bad they could not continue to serve. So it, they were significantly higher. There's no question. I, the casualty rates that I see in the 8th Air Force, I think are on par with uh, or close to, uh, I take that back. The only other major group I can think of that took casualties at that rate were, were U-boat crewmen in the Kriegsmarine in World War II. They lost about two-thirds of them. But you're right. It's, the odds of finishing a tour through the first year, uh, year and a half of the bombing campaign were about one in four, which is ridiculous. You know? And another example of the, of the rate that they lost aircraft, on the Memphis Bell's last mission, the 19th of May, when they flew to Kiel, there were 20 other B-17s in the formation with the Memphis Bell. When we look at what happened to those 20 airplanes in the following weeks and months, of those 20 airplanes, 17 of those were shot down. Two of those made it back to base after being damaged, but they were damaged so badly that they never flew again. And one of those airplanes survived to become war weary in the following months. So that the losses, they were catastrophic. It's, and it's just not well understood. That's in part why I'm so excited about that we're going to have this big exhibit that tells this great story. Here's another example. 51% of the combat deaths in the entire history of the U.S. Air Force and antecedent organizations going back to World War I, 51% of the combat deaths were heavy bomber crewmen fighting against Germany. So another way to think of it is in this huge institution, 19 acres under roof, half of the combat death is in that corner of that gallery. It, the, there, it is correct to say that there's, there has not been sacrifice to that degree by any, major, any other major group in the history of the Air Force. And I, you know, I don't know that that's uh, something that any of them would want to have that uh, kind of uh, sobering distinction. Yeah, but you know, they just, they just, it's not well known and it's frustrating because that, you know, that is our mission is to tell the story of service and sacrifice. And these young men did, and they knew the odds. They didn't need any numbers or statistics to know what their odds were. They saw what was happening. And they, I, I've come to think of the airplanes as aluminum coffins. There's an old adage about U-boats being iron coffins. Well, I feel like they were getting into aluminum coffins. And, and something to point out, too, and you'll see that in the animated bombing map, the bomber losses didn't stop. We didn't have fighter escort and all of a sudden we're only losing two or three airplanes out of a thousand. It didn't stop. We had missions where we lost 20, 30, 40 bombers. It happened over and over and over again until into 1945. The reason why it's not well known is because with raids of 1,500 bombers, that's sustainable. You know, when you lose 20 bombers out of 1,500, that's something that's sustainable. And that was something I learned from that animated bombing map. Because what I expected to see was the losses to go up, up, and up, and then in 44 to slow down. They don't. They keep going. Half of the bombers we lost in the strategic bombing campaign, we lost in 44. It's shocking. But the, but the reason why I think it's not well known is because it, was, it had been, become sustainable at that point. So, did anyone have any other questions? Okay, well, thanks again for uh, what you do. To, uh, to tell the Air Force story to the American public and, and our visitors here. Uh, we're behind the scenes, so we're, we're so grateful that you tell this story that we work so hard to put together and put out there. Thanks again.